Standing committees commence oversight functions on ministries, departments and agencies of federal government ahead of the budget defense sessions. House Ad Hoc Committee on investigating the status of looted and recovered funds threaten to take over Heritage Bank. This is the Hala Chambers. I am Tijesu Adiri. Not much is happening in the two chambers of the parliament regarding budget defense meetings with ministries, departments and agencies. But some of the standing committees have kicked off oversight to these agencies. The goal is to have first-hand information on the successes and challenges they face so as to bring in appropriate interventions during budget defense sessions. One of them is the House Committee on Defense. Ahead of budget defense meetings with government agencies, the lawmakers are on an oversight function to the Military Pensions Board. The aim is to get first-hand information on the operations here as well as the challenges at hand so as to effect necessary action in next year's budget. These obligations are met by the board. The chairman of the board, Saburi Lawal, takes the committee members through the budget expenditure in the last two years. He identifies inadequate funding, proliferation of pensioners' associations, lack of an access road and accommodation as some of the challenges the board faces. We have close to almost 15 or 16 military veterans association. A group of people will just gather themselves in one street, they will say they are veterans association. And they all want to have direct dealings <clears throat> with the board. It has become a problem for us. We have also listened carefully to your challenges. Uh, those are challenges we are going to take up seriously. You can see how active and how uh, involved my members are in asking you um, specific questions. The committee was also at the Defense Research and Development Bureau. No doubt, Nigeria is at a crossroad as insecurity pervades the country. The Bureau's establishment bill awaits concurrence of the Senate and this forms one of the topics of discussions here. The Bureau is established to provide needed census to the military in protecting the nation's territorial integrity and comes handy with the prevailing security challenges. In the bill are provisions for us to have research centers which will accommodate Nigerian scientists to work with and do the research work that we, we need. And the bill will also enable us to have the funding that is required to establish those research centers, pay their salaries and all of that. We've come, we've seen what they are, they're doing, uh, we've noticed that uh, limited in funds, but they are punching above their, 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 their resources. We would ensure that we contribute our own quota towards ensuring that they attain the status and eminence that their good qualities require. House Ad Hoc Committee on investigating the status of looted and recovered funds threatened to take over Heritage Bank. So Heritage Bank is the only one who's not here. And I need to send this message to them clearly. We're not comedians here, we're not here joking. If Heritage Bank is owing Nigeria more than its share capital, we will not hesitate to actually cause the National Assembly to write to CBN to take over that bank. They cannot be owing more than the share capital, sit on it and feel too big to actually to respond to invitation of the National Assembly. It, it doesn't um, portray these organizations and it, it tends to diminish the, the powers of, of, of this committee and the National Assembly. So I want Mr. Chairman to take into account and to for the clerk to give the last warning that if future decline of invitations could be met with a very serious um, action from the National Assembly. Nigeria moves closer to meeting the 1.5 million pints of blood target as President Mohamed Buhari assents to the National Blood Service Commission bill. Again, there is the benefit of almost eliminating commercialization of blood service in this country. As I've said earlier, of the 500,000 pints of blood that we are able to generate annually in this country, 
75% of it is coming via people selling their own blood, not through voluntary uh, donations. We are going to move from the national level to the state level to the local government level and to the world. So our blood will be made accessible to every part of this country. But that involves a holistic collaboration and cooperation among us. It requires good funding because blood is again capital intensive. There was anger and emotions as lawmakers continued their probe into the alleged extrajudicial killing of innocent persons by men of the Nigerian Customs Service. The family of the victims are also demanding over six billion naira compensation from the service. Your report that you have not read, did you have it that your men fired? No, my men defended themselves because they were butchered. And I have all the butchers here. It is important that we guide ourselves in the kind of allegations that we make. A very honorable member cannot come out and be saying that customs take bribe. You don't make sweepy allegations that you can't defend. This broker I said was not even apprehended by custom. So if to say it is smuggler that are apprehended, it's a different case. But people that are just going about their normal businesses looking for their daily livelihoods by stray bullets, they die. It's very unfortunate. I'll be talking with the sponsor of the National Climate Change Bill, now awaiting presidential assent, Honorable Samuel Ifai Onubu, representing Ikwano, Mwaihia, North and South Federal Constituency of Abia State. It's good to have you on the program. Thank you very much. Congratulations on the honor accorded you recently. It must have been well deserved. Yeah, thank you. Uh, well, uh, it's to the glory of God. Uh, the Methodist Church in uh, Nigeria, particularly the Methodist Theological Institute, Umuahe, uh, was celebrating their 65th anniversary. And uh, as such a uh, great occasion, the prelates of the Methodist Church uh, came and uh, took charge. And um, during the event, I was given the award of excellent legislative award by the church in recognition of the modest contributions that I've made and also to serve as a tonic for me to do uh, much more. You are in the front line for climate change. How far have your efforts and those of like minds paid off? Well, uh, one thing is clear. Like I said, when I served as the chairman of the House Committee on Climate Change, one of the very first things that I embarked upon was awareness campaign. And when this awareness campaign was going on, I noticed that uh, very many people were even unaware of the threats posed by climate change. But I am happy that due to a combination of efforts by different stakeholders, everyone, okay, let me say most people are now aware that the threat is real and existential in nature. Uh, so to that extent, I think uh, the efforts that we have put into it has paid off. Secondly, um, the, the government has come up, one, with uh, what was then intended nationally determined contributions, but which since uh, 2015 have become the nationally determined contributions of Nigeria in terms of what Nigeria wants to be able to do to contribute towards the reduction of greenhouse gases. What is your assessment of Nigeria's efforts at tackling the scourge? To be fair to you and to do an unbiased assessment, the government has picked up. The efforts have increased. Uh, that's what I was trying to explain. And the kind of support that 
an organization like the Great Green Wall, you know, uh, is getting right now is uh, a clear indication that this government is serious. And of course, I just talked about 25 million trees uh, to be planted. And these are efforts that are getting the direct involvement of Mr. President. So I know that this is, you know, a genuine effort. I, I, I have heard what you talked about, different policies. And sometimes, you know, as we have had different governments over a period of time, beginning from the military, that you also experience some policies, some assaults. But I think there's some elements of consistency now. Uh, last time when we set the, our uh, uncondi I mean, conditional, a commitment to fighting climate change. We, we just set a target of about 45%. But between then and now, which is just about, about five years, we've increased it to 47 So I see genuine efforts. And of course, the threat is real. You know, uh, the threat is real. Like I said before now, it just seemed like, okay, it's one of those things. But if you see a combination of the threats coming from the Sahel, both, you know, the ecological challenge in, form, in the form of desertification drought, and then the other one that has actually led to forced migration and banditry, and some of these things encroaching upon us. And what have been the challenges? Well, I think it's lack of political will. And the fact that perhaps people did not see that something needed to be done in, a, in an organized and sustainable way. Perhaps it was lost on people, but right now, with the threats that are coming, that are existential in nature, I think everyone, all hands are on deck right now. And that's why from the legislative angle, we are pushing the bill to provide a platform for the government to be able to implement some things backed up by law. You are the sponsor of the National Climate Change Bill, which awaits presidential assent. What space is it coming to fill when it becomes law? Well, it's going to do a whole lot. One, you've talked about policies. you talked about policies here. And over time, we used to have this policy, that policy. But this policy or that policy pronounced by this government or that government, these are policies. But once a law is in place, unless it is repealed, or amended, it is the law. Um, so the effort is geared towards having in place a law on climate change to support certain actions, to set certain targets that we as a nation or organizations can be judged by. And then to provide the enabling environment by having a council, a national council on climate change. This council shall be chaired by Mr. President and his absence, the Vice President. And uh, it's going to have, uh, its membership will comprise key ministries that are directly impacted by climate change. And it has the potential to be able to set those policies, you know, put them in place, monitor them. Let's talk about the 2015 Paris Agreement. How helpful has that been? You can see that all these things I've talked about, targets, uh, nationally determined contributions, and all this, all these are contained in this Paris Agreement. What have we done is to set, set targets that we can monitor ourselves. But it is done in such a way that countries are allowed to come up with their own laws. But overall target is to ensure that uh, we do not allow... Uh, temperature to rise beyond 1.5 degrees Celsius. Uh, because if we allow it to, if we don't have a combined effort, both by the greatest polluters in the world and those who are not polluting, well, you know this thing is borderless. You know, if you pollute in China, pollute in the United States, the impact is felt here. So that's why all hands are supposed to come on deck. So the Paris Agreement is happening. And some of these laws that have been made are in that shape. 
And you also must have noticed that between then and now, several countries have set net zero emissions. That is standard that you know, between now and X period, we will stop or we will reduce our contributions to greenhouse gases by X percentage. You can see so far, I think there are just uh, a few countries, about two, that have attained net zero. So the, the rest of them, even those who are doing well, like Sweden and all that, those ones perhaps by 2030, they probably attain net zero. But these other big ones, you know, I think the Chinese are setting something like other 2060 or so. We are setting between 2050 to 2070, you know, because we are dependent on, um, we are dependent on, our economy is fossil fuel dependent. So our transition from that to uh, we are going perhaps going to move first to gas and then renewable energy or this is side by side it has to be just uh, it has to be inclusive and i would say it has to be humane because we are not going to do, you know uh, commit suicide by saying we are um, we want to meet net zero and therefore we stop the things that are supposed to help our economy to grow you are the president of Globe in Nigeria. Take us through its contributions to the struggle for a more friendly environment. Uh, the Global Legislators Organization for a Balanced Environment, that's Globe, uh, is uh, a global association of parliamentarians, national parliamentarians. Uh, and what's their aim? Their aim is to ensure that parliamentarians take interest, extra interest in environments, climate change-based legislations and policies to support them uh, as a way of ensuring that we contribute our own quota in achieving the set limits. Uh, so far, GLOBE has done so well. Uh, interestingly, in Nigeria, I am the president and also the vice president for Africa. So we have embarked on critical intellectual products uh, last Thursday, we launched three major products that are intended to contribute towards the reduction of emissions. One is a nature-based kind of product like the natural capital accounting as a way of recognizing the forests, uh, recognizing the oceans, recognizing what is in all these places in calculating the GDP. Because once you are aware that these things have value, we are likely to preserve them. And Whenever anybody is working on the GDP, you don't talk just about uh, goods and services produced in a country you know, over a period of one year. You have to factor them in and use them. That's the essence of the natural uh, capital accounting. Then we're also talking about redu reducing emissions from deforestation and forest degradation. That's what you call red plus. These things also are intended to help because if you reduce emissions from forests, deforestation, you know, as people fell trees and all that, and you work on how to ensure that even the areas that were previously degraded are built back, they also help us towards our efforts to keep the rising temperature to 1.5 degrees. How willing is Mr. President to sign the bill and how sure are we that the bill is on Mr. President's table? That's, that's a big question. But if you juxtapose your question against the fact that I said earlier that Mr. President made a promise, you know, on the 29th of May 2015, that he was going to fight climate change. And I have cited instances of efforts that he has made. You, uh, you can also go ahead and add this to some lofty declarations that he has made over time, whether the United Nations... Uh, I recall that in 2016, on September 22nd, he signed the Paris Agreement on Climate Change. I was lucky to be there. And then he has also gone out during his you know, global visits to make declarations, commitments by Nigeria. So for us to have been able, from the angle of the legislature, to pass a legislation of that magnitude, I have no doubt whatsoever that as a president that has committed to tackling distance, you know, in a verifiable manner, that 
he'll go ahead. I know that once a bill has been passed by the National Assembly, it is the duty of the bureaucracy of the National Assembly, you know, to ensure that the bill is transmitted. So I want to believe that the National Assembly uh, uh, will do the need for ensuring that the bill gets to Mr. President. Away from that, as a leader in the Southeast, how concerned are you about the crisis rocking your region? I am absolutely concerned. Check the Constitution. And you'll find uh, the section, uh, section 14, 2B, that you, you, the primary purpose of any government is the security of life and property. So from that angle, I am deeply concerned as a Nigerian and as someone from the Southeast. But maybe I will take consolation in the fact that just yesterday, Mr. President held another, you know, Security Council meeting uh, where he has urged the different security arms, intelligence arm, to ensure that we are able to provide security uh, for the forthcoming Anambra election and beyond. Uh, you talk about banditry in that part of the country. We should all be concerned, not just about the Southeast, but about banditry in the entire country. You know, coming from the Southeast, spreading to the Northwest, going to North Central, and now we're talking about the challenges we have in the Northeast. So as a person, as a Nigerian, as an Igbo man, I am concerned, deeply concerned, and I want to use this opportunity to appeal to uh, people who are involved to please calm down, let peace reign, and so that we can find space to be able to negotiate on the issues that have led to this agitation. And how justified is IPOB with its agitations? Well, it's, it's important that you situate your questions, you know, very well. The reason I'm saying this is that when crises start, they start in different forms. When we started with, when, when Boko Haram came first, although they started by, you know, burning churches, killing people in the church and all that. And then gradually they moved to mosques. But gradually they left that and then it has been transforming. So no shape of banditry, no shape of, you know, disturbance or insecurity is welcome because right now it's not good for anybody. I mean, just two days ago, uh, the train that was going to Kaduna was burned. It's, no, it's not safe anywhere. So our appeal, my appeal, without necessarily coming to say, okay, it is Boko Haram, it is the terrorism, is for us to truly just like I said, Mr. President called this meeting yesterday. Maybe you call many more of such meetings, but not just for the security heads alone. But the traditional rulers, the development union, you know, executives in towns, because, you know, the Igbos operate according to development unions and all that. So that different groups. Last time we had an interfaith, you know, uh, uh, dinner, where we had an emir come to meet with the prelate and members of the church and with his team all geared towards how to find solutions to this ill wind. It's clearly an ill wind that blows no one well. It's no question of, okay, it is just for the Southeast. Do you agree with IPOB on its demands for Biafra? Biafra agitation, Biafra, see, these things are symbolisms. They reflect a feeling by a people that look, if you are not carrying them along, people will always, you know, protest either by grumbling or by embarking on some kind of action. So, but what I just said, and I, I guess you listen to me clearly, is that it's important for peace to reign so that these concerns, these things that led to agitation, I said it earlier, maybe you didn't hear me very well, that they can be discussed and addressed. But things that lead to agitation, uh, discrimination, exclusion, and all that, and all that, they will always give rise to something that someone is saying, no, I'm not happy about what, the way you are treating me. But how do you resolve it? And that's why I put forward the suggestion that we should be able to have these things discussed on the table so that we find a way out instead of 
you know, now you're talking about the IPOB uh, uh, crisis and destruction. But we also have the Boko Haram. You have the banditry. You can see the slaughter that went on in Sokoto. So it's a national tragedy that has to be addressed in a holistic manner. We look forward to a busy week as MDAs are expected to take turns before the committee to defend your budget proposals. That's our program for the week. You can watch the program again on TVC News YouTube channel. Do not forget to like, subscribe and share. Also follow me on Facebook, Instagram and all other social media platforms. My name is TJ Suadiri. Thank you for watching. See you next time.